Our scripture passage today is from the good news according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Before we read this, let us pause for a moment in prayer. Good and heavenly Father, you have given us so many gifts, and you have given us so much to guide us, Lord. And today we thank you that you have given us your word. Lord, you have spoken to your prophets and to your people that these things might be recorded, that we would know you better. So, Father, we pray that as we look into your holy word, that you would illuminate us and guide us. As we know, Father, we can understand none of these things that you have revealed unless your spirit would speak to us in our hearts and in our minds. And so we come to you, Lord, with open hearts and open minds and pray, Lord, that you would teach us and instruct us. Father, bless this holy reading of your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. After we read the scripture passage, there will be a brief moment of quiet meditation following. This is the good news according to Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. Listen now to the word of the Lord. That very day... Two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? And he said to to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a mighty prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped... He was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him... They did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to which the village they were going. He acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, one of the most embarrassing things I think a person can do is to be in a conversation with somebody you're supposed to know and you can't remember their name. I mean, not only is it embarrassing, it's a little bit frightening. Because 
I mean, well, it happens to me all the time. i got to confess you. It happens to me a lot. If it wasn't for the Lord's wisdom and, and, and uh, hooking me up with a wife who's really good at remembering names, I mean, I would be, I would be miserable. And, and it's always a terrifying experience because I'm worried that at any moment I might have to tell, say their name, and I'm not going to be able to come up with it. So I've made a habit of just calling people man. Hey, man, what's up? How you doing, buddy? And it's everybody's man. Hey, man, because I don't have to remember a name that way. I can just call everybody man or buddy or something like that. Well, there is actually an even more frightening situation than I've been in before, and, and maybe you can sympathize with it because maybe you've been in it also. It's not just talking to somebody where you can't remember their name. It's talking to somebody that knows you, and you have no idea who they are. And and it's not like they're just coming up and talking casually. They're talking in a way that it's obvious they know who you are. And you don't just remember their name. You don't remember their face. You don't know who they are, and you're like, how does this person know me? And and I've, I've been in situations where they actually knew a lot about me. And the more they said about me, the, 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 the more frightened I became. I'm like, am I losing my memory or, or is this person stalking me? I mean, I'm talking about someone, I have no idea who they are. And they're like, oh, it's crazy. I heard your daughter's in fourth grade. Is, is that fourth grade? I'm like, yeah. yeah. And, and your son, oldest son's graduating. Wow, how time flies. And I'm thinking, who is this person? And how do they know so much about me? And usually I find out, Liz will say, oh, yeah, I'm friends with her on Facebook. It's Facebook that does it. It, it, It's made that situation a lot worse for me because there's so many people out there that know intimate details of my life, and I don't know who they are. Uh, It can happen a lot with, with childhood friends. Somebody you haven't seen in maybe 20 years or more, and they've grown up, they've changed a lot, not just physically, but just through experiences of life, and it can be tough recognizing somebody you're supposed to know. But imagine that you spend three years with a person. And when I say spend three years, you're with them almost every single day for three years. You eat with them, you talk with them, you work with them, you're going out traveling with them. They're like a constant companion to you for three years. And after these three years, you're separated for three days. Okay? You, you know them very well. Three years you've known them very well. You're separated for three days. Is it possible after those three days that you wouldn't recognize that person anymore? I mean, I think it's impossible. How, how could you not recognize a person if you've known them that long after only being separated for three days? Now, if you're like me, you read this story and you were thinking, how in the world did those disciples not recognize Jesus? For three years, they had traveled with him. For three years, they had talked with him. For three years, they had sat at his feet and, and, and just absorbed all that he was teaching them. I mean, they shared life. They had troubles. They had persecutions together. There was so much they went through together. And it took just three days And they couldn't recognize him anymore. Just three days and they had forgotten his face. And that's what we read this this encounter they had with Christ. He he had just died and this this happens on Easter morning. Okay, It's just that day of the resurrection. So he's only been gone for three days. And the disciples are going to this village called Emmaus. And Jesus appears beside them. And they don't recognize him. Here he is walking just right there beside him, and the disciples have no idea who this is. And he even asked them about what's going on. So what's going on? And they're amazed. You don't know? You have no idea? Where have you been? Well, tell me, what's going on? And so they start talking about Jesus, how, how he was a great prophet, how mighty he was, and that they had hoped he'd be the one to redeem Israel. And here is Jesus right beside them. And they're talking about him, and they still don't know him. And then Jesus he even ups it more. He's like, you know, how did you not believe? And, and he starts teaching him again, just like he always has, about how all these things must have happened, how it had to take place, how the scriptures had to be fulfilled, and the disciples still don't recognize him. And when I read the story, I ask myself, if the disciples didn't recognize Jesus when he appeared before them, what hope is there for me that I would recognize Jesus. 
What hope is there at all that I will be able to recognize Jesus if he appears in my life? And I'm not just talking about if he come, when he comes back, because I think that's going to be you know, a pretty big event when Jesus returns. we hopefully be able to recognize him then. I'm talking about the way that Jesus appears in our life today. How he talks to us, how he walks with us, how he moves in our life, how, we, how he communicates things to us. And I think he still does, mainly because of a promise that Jesus made right before he went to heaven. He told his disciples, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. And I know Jesus moves in our life and, 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 he, and he talks with us and moves in our life sometimes. And I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss that. If, if he is here and present with me, I want to know it. Not just, not just for me to know, because I like to know things, but I want to know that this is Christ here, and not just my imagination. I want to know that this is the Lord talking to me and instructing me, and not me just making things up like what I want to hear. And how great, how great would it be to know that Jesus is not just sitting up there in heaven, just looking down from afar, just, oh, I wonder what Rob's going to do next. That crazy guy is always doing crazy stuff. But he's, but he's right here with me. He's right here, just like the disciples, walking here beside me, encouraging me, strengthening me, seeing me through the tough times that I go through. And it's, and it's a bit harder for us to recognize when Jesus moves in our life than it is for the disciples because he's not here with us in the body like he was with his disciples. I believe Jesus still talks to us, but he, he talks to us in much less direct ways than he spoke to the disciples while he was here on earth. Sometimes Jesus speaks to us through his presence. You may have felt it before. You just feel this, this presence come over you all of a sudden, this, this presence of warmth and love and, and sometimes of strength and compassion. Sometimes when you least expect it, sometimes when you're crying out for it, sometimes when you feel like you need it the most. Sometimes Jesus will, will talk to us by, by moving our heart. Sometimes people will, will all of a sudden think of another person. They haven't seen him in years and all of a sudden a, a, a thought will pop in their mind, you need to call Bob. I haven't talked to Bob in 20 years. You need to call Bob. And then you end up calling Bob, and Bob's like, man, I'm glad to hear from you because I've been wanting to hear a word from a friend. And that was Jesus talking to you. Sometimes today, Jesus talks to us by uh, putting a burden in our hearts, a sentiment for, for a people group. You might say, you know what? I can't stop thinking about the poor people of Columbia. I don't know why. I just think about them all the time. Maybe that's Christ just put a burden on your heart because he's sending you to the poor of Columbia. Sometimes Jesus talks to us through other people, through our leaders in our life and, and through advice that other people give us. Sometimes that is Christ talking to us. Sometimes Christ appears through us through signs or through opportunities. He can appear through doors that are open. He can appear through doors that are closed. Some people still today have talked to me about having dreams of Jesus. And even rarer yet are those, but it still does happen, people hearing the voice of Jesus in their life. What I mean to say about all this is there are a lot of ways that Christ still talks with us. There are a lot of ways that we can encounter Christ in our life today, but it can make it hard to know that this is Jesus and not just something I'm making up in my own head. Well, this story today, though, teaches us how we can be ready for an encounter with Christ. The story teaches us how we can recognize Jesus moving in our life and how can we know it is Christ here walking beside us. Basically, there's two things that we need in order to be able to recognize Jesus and recognize an encounter with our Lord. Two things we need. We need familiarity and we need expectation. Those two will help us recognize Jesus in our life. Familiarity and expectation. Now, familiarity is kind of self-explanatory, right? 
We cannot recognize Jesus in our life unless we're familiar with him. And we can't be familiar with Jesus unless we get to know him. You can't know anybody or you can't be familiar with anybody that you don't know, that you've had no contact with or no prior experience. Now, there's a lot of ways that we can become familiar with Jesus. There's a lot of ways that we can get to know him, hear him now. But the most important part is we have to be deliberate. Just like when you want a relationship with your wife or a friend or somebody else, and you've got to have deliberate time that you carve out with them. If you want to be familiar with Jesus, you've got to be intentional about carving out time that you spend with your Savior. Now, the more time you spend with Him, the better you get to know Him. The better you get to know Him, the easier it is to recognize Jesus when He moves in your life. And the opposite also is true. The less time you spend with Him, the less you will know of Him. The less you will know of Him, the harder it will be able to see Christ moving in your life. Now, one of the best ways that we can get to know Jesus is to simply study Him, is to study about Him. The Word that God has given us has so much about Christ. I'm talking about from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, Prophets, everything. It is full of Jesus. Jesus kind of jumps out almost on every single page. But if you really want to get to know him, the best place to see it are the Gospels. Four books in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all written explicitly about Jesus. And when you read this, you start reading it not just to get like advice or morals, but read it to get to know Christ. Read it to get to know, like, how is he talking? How does he react to people? How does he interact with others? What are the kinds of things he says, the kinds of things that he, that he does? Is getting to know Jesus as an intimate friend from the things that were written down about him. Another great way that we can be intimate and know Jesus is, is to spend direct time with him. And what I'm talking about is, is right here in worship. Um, earlier you heard me say when Jesus told his disciples, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there in your midst. That means every time two or three or people are gathered together, Jesus is with us. That means he's here now. Because I, I know, at least I hope, we at least got two or three people that are gathered here in the name of Jesus, which means Christ is with us right now. You are spending time with Christ. We don't see him in the body. We might be, be kind of hard to recognize him, but you right now are spending time with Christ. And that to me was perhaps the worst consequence of the shutdown that we have with our churches is so many people for a long time were not able to spend that intimate time with Jesus. And that to me is what makes church so great. This is not just a place where we worship, not just a place where we go to Sunday to learn great lessons. This is time that we get to spend with our Savior. And there might be some of you still that don't feel safe coming to a church, don't feel safe coming into a crowd. But I urge you, find two people you do feel safe with. I know you can find at least two people who also can come in the name of Christ that you will feel safe with. Get together. Gather together so you can be in His presence. Another great thing you can do to get to know your Savior is spend time with the people who reflect the heart and character of Christ. And that's spending time with other people who love Jesus as well. Because G Jesus is reflected in His people. And everybody that loves Him, they carry Christ with them. All of you who love Christ, you carry Christ in your hearts. And, and as you spend time with another person who carries Christ in their heart as well, then both of you, both of you get to share the intimacy of Christ together. Now, I'm not talking about saints. I'm not talking about someone who's, who's super pure and never does anything wrong. Just somebody who longs for the heart of Christ. Because both of you all together, seeking Christ together, can achieve the enemy, intimacy with your Savior that is much harder to do on your own. 
The key, though, the key here to getting to know your Savior is being deliberate about it. Turning your heart to Him. Turning your thoughts to Him. Turning your emotions to Him. And I'm telling you, it really does work. It really does work. There are so many people that have been able to achieve intimacy. A true intimacy with their Lord and Savior. Because they sought the time to be deliberate. To get to know Jesus. Now, but this really wasn't the disciples' problem, though. The disciples knew Jesus. The disciples knew Jesus well. And it was ultimately that familiarity that enabled them to recognize Christ. For so long, they they walked next to him on that road and didn't know who he was. But in, in the story, they're sitting with him and he does something just very simple. He breaks bread. And all of a sudden, they recognize him. Something they'd seen him do probably a hundred times. and It was probably that real familiar motion. He, he did it in just a way that only he did it. And as soon as he broke that bread, they were like, I know you. Yes, I know you. How, how could I have not seen? It's you. You've been with us that whole time. And, and our familiarity with Jesus, the more we get to know him, enables us to have that moment as well. It's you. You've been with me whole time. Now, honestly, the disciples should have recognized him earlier. They should have recognized him a lot earlier. Familiarity was not their problem. In fact, the problem the disciples had is the biggest problem we have to in recognizing Jesus in our life. It's the biggest barrier to experiencing Jesus in your life is expectation is to expect to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. That's why we don't experience Him. That's why we fail to see Him so much is because we don't expect to see Him. We, we write it off as a possibility. We're not even looking. The disciples weren't looking. The disciples were not expecting an experience with Jesus Christ. In fact, they quite logically quite logically assumed that he was dead and being dead would follow the pattern of most dead people and he would stay dead. They they even told Jesus that himself. We we had hoped, oh, we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And they're telling him of all their dashed hopes. They weren't expecting an encounter with Christ. In fact, Jesus might be the last person that they expected to see on the road with them. And that is why they didn't recognize him. And if you are familiar with Jesus, and I know you are familiar with Jesus, the biggest reason you might not recognize him in your life is you're not expecting him to be there. And, and honestly, why would we? We've been raised in this enlightened, rational world, and we might believe in those miracles and stories of the Bible that happened a long time ago, but do we believe enough to expect them to happen to us here and now and today? Or maybe we believe those things happened in another time, but they don't happen in our time. Or maybe we believe they happened to other people, but we don't really expect them to happen to us. Or maybe we don't expect him because we're afraid we'll hear from him. We're afraid we'll hear that voice and then we'll be one of those people that say they hear the voice of God. And we know what the world thinks about that. If you want to know what the world thinks about that, tell somebody that God's spoken to you. You'll get that look. You don't know what I'm talking about? You'll know what I'm talking about pretty soon. If you tell someone that God has spoken to you, and that can be a frightening thing for us. And mostly we don't expect to encounter Christ because 99% of our day doesn't consist of us hearing from God. It consists of us going to work and fixing meals and being worried about this and being worried about that and going on with the business of our day, not regularly hearing from God. So why would we expect a change? It's not a normal part of our day, so why would we expect today, this day, to be any different? Now, these are all natural reasons, all logical reasons, all seemingly good reasons. The only problem, though, is that expectation can keep us from recognizing Christ in our life. 
We can be like the disciples, Jesus walking right there beside us, and we have no idea he's there because we're not expecting it. We can miss that moment too, that moment where Jesus moves into our life and he's right there beside us and we don't see it and we don't recognize it because we're not expecting it. And we can miss this, this powerful moment in our life where everything changes, This miss this moment where it's the blessing that we've been waiting so long to get. Now, I don't want anybody to freak out on me here. I don't want anybody here to get stressed out and think, oh, what if I've missed it? What if I've missed it? What if the moment that I've been waiting for has come and gone, Jesus was with me, and I missed it completely? Good news, Jesus can change everything about your life, and you have no idea it's him doing it. He probably already has done it. Jesus can bless you incredibly and has blessed you incredibly and you have no idea. You might suspect it was Christ but not know that it was Christ that was moving in your life. That can happen. But how much better for us to know? How much better for us to know that it was Christ who blessed us? How much better for us to know that it was Jesus who was walking with us and guiding us? How much better for us to know so so we can give credit where credit is due, so we can have more reason to praise Him. But how much better for us to know because of the strength and faith it gives us in life. How much better is it to know that Christ is moving in your life? And what it does for our hope and what it does for our trust in Him and what it does for our faith in God and how much more we can trust God for what He's doing in us and for what He's doing in the world when we know that this is Jesus Christ that is moving in my life. And it can change everything. It can change everything. It can change how you think of God how you think of your life, how you think of yourself and what your place is here in this world. And it's a choice between either Jesus is up there just kind of looking down at humanity or he's walking right beside you, intimately involved in your life. And the answer, he's intimately involved in your life. He is walking here beside you. Because Christ cares about you. You are important to Him. And moreover, Jesus made a promise. He made a promise to every single one of His disciples. No one that belongs to me will I lose. No one can snatch you out of my hand. I will personally see to it that you make it home one day. The Lord's going to bless you whether you recognize it or not. Christ is going to be with you whether you see it or not, but how much better to know that that is Jesus walking beside you. How much better to know that that is your Lord standing next to you. How much better to know that this is your Savior seeing you through this difficult time and every trouble you will face. How much better to know Christ himself is in your midst, staying true to his promise, staying true to his word, that he will be with you always, even until the end of the age. To God be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.